What if our efforts to close the digital divide are actually widening it? Now, the digital divide is the gap between those who have easy access to computers, the internet, and emerging technologies, and those without. But more importantly, it's about the greater economic opportunity made possible through technology. The digital divide generally falls along socioeconomic lines, which, of course, track closely with race. Most efforts to close this gap have focused on access. It's even in the term, internet access. The basic idea being that if we make devices, the internet, and training less expensive and more broadly accessible to all, then the economic benefits will follow. But here's the funny thing. If you had told me, or really anyone in technology, in 1999, hey, 20 years from now, 77% of all Americans and 90% of adults under 50 would own a pocket supercomputer with always-on, wireless, high-speed internet. We'd have said, sign me up for that future. Digital divide closed. Now that we're here in 2019, how are we doing? Well, in a recent study of Silicon Valley companies, looking at median representation among employees, just 2.5% of employees are black and 5.6% are Latinx. Here in Philadelphia, we were recently named in a 2017 study as the best city for diversity in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. 18% of STEM employees in Philly are black, which sounds better, right? Until you remember that 42% of our city's population is black. Oh, and by the way, only one-third of Philly STEM employees are women. So in industry, we still have a ways to go. How about in higher education, which is our future workforce? Right? If we look at black students in the computing fields, starting in 2002, 3.6% of bachelor's degrees, 1.3% of master's, and 1.3% of PhDs were awarded to black people. Now, in 2017, which is the most recent year for which we have data, things have gone up to 3.7%, 1.6%, and PhDs have gone from 10 to 18. Yes, all of the black graduates in North America who received a PhD in computing in 2017 could fit around a conference room table. Clearly, in higher ed, there's still some work to do. So you might say, well, you know, there's this hot new trend in education, particularly in K-12, called making. Making is a mashup of shop class and electronics and computing to create everything from doorbells to robots. It's been heavily promoted as a way of broadening participation in technology. Well, the flagship publication of this maker movement is Make Magazine, which has been around for more than 10 years. Tech and education researcher Leah Beakley did an analysis of representation on Make Magazine covers. And while most of the discussion subsequently talked about gender, she also pointed out in 2014 that no black person had ever been on the cover of Make Magazine. Well, I'm here to tell you that in 2019, no black person has ever been on the cover of Make Magazine. I think the absence of, rep of representation speaks volumes and is a very troubling sign. So here we are, more than 20 years since the digital divide first became a concern, and more than 10 years into the smartphone era. And while we've achieved enormous gains in terms of access to technology, we now know that access is not enough. The unintended consequence of fixating on access has been that we lost sight of the real goal, equity, equal economic opportunity through technology. I think that's because in tech, we tend to fixate on certain things. And we have 
unintentionally, because of the great gains in, in economics through technology, we've actually widened the divide. Not only adversely impacting people of color, but anyone who lacks socioeconomic privilege. The problem is that in tech, we love to believe that the new, new thing will solve the problem. A device, an app, a service. And I have to admit that for many years, I was complicit in this kind of thinking. That if we simply made the tech good enough, then we would achieve equity. But as Columbia professor and founder of the hip hop ed movement, Chris Emden, has succinctly put it, you can't just tech away your problems. Here's also where I should check my privilege, that I'm an academic, I'm a research institute director, I'm an Asian American professor of engineering, absolutely a position of privilege. Now, I grew up in central Illinois with an inescapably Korean name, and oops, I don't really speak Korean. <laughs> I studied music in college and graduate school, and as an Asian musician and performer, I've often found myself in a very different situation. One, at an audition or a performance where I felt out of place, distinct not because of my talent, or lack thereof, but distinct because of my appearance. Sometimes I wished I could fast forward a few decades to a time where people who looked like me could have leading roles in Broadway musicals and Hollywood movies. It's just starting to happen now, which is probably too late for my showbiz career, but I still find it incredibly exciting. So, I think this is why a cultural perspective can be so revealing. Not my culture, not your culture, but the shared culture of our society. The tech industry has tried so hard to inject tech culture into the mainstream. But what it really needs is a culture transplant, replacing an exclusionary white and Asian male monoculture with one of equal representation and inclusion. So I think it's helpful to look at this from a completely different lens, that of music. Now, I'm sure you know the classical composers of old, the Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. Now, I'm a music major, so I love Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, but no one would suggest that these white men are the most influential musicians of 2019. No, our musical culture, of course, has evolved to include artists of different genres, ethnicities, and representations, right? Different traditions, right? Um, but if you look at the top, the, the Billboard's top song from every year since the 1940s, when they first started creating this chart, you'll notice something. More and more color, figuratively and literally, among the top-selling artists. Now, this is not to say that the music industry is equitable, it's not, but only to say it now includes a broader representation of our society. So how did we get here? There were courageous pioneers throughout history, many of them, who found alternative pathways into the mainstream, who went against traditional music culture and the entrenched industry. I'm talking about the early giants of jazz, like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, who used bold, brass instruments to create an entirely new sound in an era without amplification. I'm talking about the Motown sound, where Motown Records founder Barry Gordy tuned his music for the fidelity of car radios to craft an audio experience that was broadly accessible and yet signature to his label. And of course, the founders of hip-hop, who couldn't get access to the discotheques of the 1970s and instead used technology, tapes, and records, spinning and scratching, to create an entirely new genre that is arguably the most popular today. Imagine now, for a moment, a world without those pioneers. What would our music sound like? Where would our society be? 
Well, in tech, we have our own classical giants, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Mark Zuckerberg. And our society, in some ways, has been so blinded by their success to an extreme view that tech can solve any problem. But if we ask all to follow only their traditions, how will we ever see something that shakes those foundations, like jazz, like Motown, or the hip-hop of technology? Well, you might say, in music, things have turned out OK. Right? Why don't we just let this play out in tech? Well, first of all, we have much greater knowledge than the early days of jazz more than 100 years ago. We can and we should be doing this much better. But second, and perhaps most importantly, tech is an amplifier. Tech is best at accelerating and scaling, but what if we amplify the wrong things? If we propagate an exclusionary monoculture, we make it less likely for new and diverse contributions to emerge and take flight. Imagine a world without jazz, without Motown, without hip hop. So how do we change the culture of tech rather than being changed by it? Here are some of the things we're doing at the Excite Center right here in Philadelphia. First, we employ culture to better understand technology. Our youth outreach programs use cultural touchstones like sneakers and music to authentically reveal and explore the tech that lies within, embracing culturally responsive teaching, research, and practice. In this way, we promote the value of our shared culture over pure technology. We also don't think in terms of STEM, but rather STEAM, that's integrating the arts and design alongside science, technology, engineering, and math. 50 years of math and science emphasis has gotten us into the situation we're in today. We believe that by integrating and celebrating the creativity that's inherent in both the arts and the sciences is a much more profound way to learn. We learned better. We are so proud to partner with the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation, who does such great work in education, in sports programming, and social justice. Together, we've established the Young Dragons Program, a six-week summer STEAM camp for middle school students in the West Philadelphia Promise Zone. In this program, we break down the artificial walls between disciplines and instead offer hands-on, relevant, arts-integrated STEAM learning activities. We also seek other great partners and collaborate to amplify their amazing efforts. Here are some of the incredible projects and people that I have the privilege of working with. Making Culture is a national study of 30 education makerspaces revealing pervasive implicit bias among maker, maker learning program, <coughs> excuse me, among maker learning programs. Black girls steaming through dance. This is an incredible program for West Philly middle school girls that integrates fashion and wearable tech and coding and dance performance. Hip hop makerspaces working with others across the country to develop welcoming and inclusive learning spaces. So those are some of the things we're doing. But what can you do to help change the culture of tech? Well, if you work in technology, please check out Code 2040. This is a nonprofit devoted not to coding, but to achieving equal equity and representation in the tech industry. Here, 2040 refers to the year in which the US is projected to become majority people of color. There, you'll find others you can work with to change the culture of tech from within. If you're not in tech, be an informed consumer of products and services. Look at tech companies' annual diversity reports, and there you'll see which companies are making real progress and which companies not so much. Follow the work of the Algorithmic Justice League. This is an organization 
devoted to looking at, exploring, and examining companies' AI systems for racial and gender bias. Look for companies that are embracing the principles of inclusive design, not only for accessibility, but for broadening representation. And most importantly, maintain a healthy skepticism towards new tech-driven initiatives. So often, they have blind spots when it comes to equity and inclusion. If you're in education, in addition to those I mentioned previously, follow the Connected Learning Alliance. They advocate for uh, interest-driven learning through technologies in the service of equity and opportunity. And similarly, support some of the great public schools here in Philadelphia, Science Leadership Academy, the Workshop School, and others that integrate technology, but within a bedrock of community, citizenship, and social justice. Now, if you're in higher education, pardon me, but what the hell are you waiting for? We should be the ones ahead of the curve, not behind it. They say we have a STEM crisis in higher ed. No, we have a culture crisis, and we can't tech our way out of that. Stop trading upon uh, superficial STEM deficits, which have more to do with a student's zip code than their ability to code. Look at the data, and then do the hard work it takes to support a culture of equity and innovation and inclusion. And if you're a leader in a position of leadership and a position of privilege, make it clear that the status quo is unacceptable. That if we continue to propagate a exclusionary monoculture, we miss the far greater opportunity of a richer, more inclusive, and yes, more innovative society. Instead, we will have a world without jazz, without Motown, and without hip-hop. And then we'll all lose. So perhaps this will help you. Think of these three not as aspirational role models, but as equivalent to the classical composers of old. Encouraging young people to be like this is as absurd as asking them to be like this. <laughs> Instead, we need them to be technology's version of Louis Armstrong, or Diana Ross, or Grandmaster Flash, or Aquafina. And I am so excited to see that future. It can happen, but it won't happen on its own. Let's work together to make sure that it does. Thank you.